Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. We talked about Ruby Payne Scott this week. Uh Uh-huh. A woman who I sort of love. Yeah. Um, I will talk about one quote that I did not include because it used phrasing that I think we both hate. Sure. But I want to mention it here because it's a good example of how even people who are your allies can say things that they maybe don't mean to be so awful, but are. Oh, no. Which is that in Joan Freeman's biography, she describes Ruby as shrill. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I hate I knew it. you would. But she also says, like, but she used that voice to, like, advocate for change. And it's like, mm, I see what you're doing, but I know I wish, yeah. I wish you would have chosen any other word. Again, too, that was written... Many years ago. I was just going to ask when it was written, because I for sure have read things for work that were written a decade or more ago that I feel like if the person were writing it today, they would not have used that language. Yeah. I think she probably wouldn't have. Like, I read, I don't remember which, uh, I think maybe it was some of the G.K. Chesterton Mm -hmm. research there were people that had a focus on his weight that I think might, no, I won't say it might have been handled kind of sensitively for the, because it wasn't it really, but like, I really feel like some of the folks who wrote those things, were they writing them now, would not. They choose different language. Yeah. Yeah. I really, we didn't talk a ton about it, but I really, really love pretty much any discussion of Ruby and her family. Mm -hmm. And particularly, Ruby and Bill seemed smitten with each other. Mm -hmm. And there are some very fun pictures that I found in one of the biographies I read, which is called Under the Radar. And they're pictures of them, like, with their bushwalking club and Mm -hmm. things that were taken by their bushwalking club. And there's one particular photograph taken in 1947, so they would have been married a few years at that point. And they're out in the middle of nowhere, and Ruby is washing Bill's hair. And it's the sweetest, most charming thing to me. I don't. It's so, like, cute and... You know, anytime you see people who are married taking care of one another in that mm-hmm. way, I find it very charming. And it's so sweet. Um, and they they do always seem like they're just sort of completely gaga over each other, which I love. Yeah, yeah. We didn't talk about their kids much. Their kids are still alive, but I will say they produced a mathematician who's incredibly well-respected in their son, Peter. And they're, if you have, if any part of you, um, if you're an art person, heard the name Fiona and went, is that Fiona Hall, the fairly well-known sculptor? It is. That's their daughter. Um, She has done a lot of amazing art over the years and continues to. Mm -hmm. Um, So, like I said, didn't want to focus on them too much, but yes, pretty amazing kids from what seemed to be two pretty amazing parents. Uh, Mm -hmm. When you think about the fact that Bill was a feminist in the 1940s, that seems pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, they were, uh, apparently Ruby also loved kitties, which just endears me to her even more. They always had cats at home. Mm-hmm. Um, I found myself reading about her and being floored at every turn. Yeah. Because she was so very outspoken about issues in ways that we don't really think about happening until like the 70s. In yeah, terms yeah. of her being like, no, we need equal rights and that's going to happen and I'm not giving up and I'm advising all of my colleagues to not give up until we get them. And mm-hmm. it's like, wait, in 1949 you were doing this? Right. <laughs> um, I also mentioned that we would talk a little bit about the Communist Party thing. Yeah. So here is why there's not much about it. She was suspected to be a member of the Communist Party for a long time. Um, Well, she must have been because they gave her that nickname, right? Well, she was, but there wasn't um, conclusive evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, like, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization had a dossier on her. They thought she was a communist, but there wasn't any 
direct evidence that they had initially. And it wasn't mm-hmm. until m- later when a, a person who had also been a member of the Australian Communist Party, which um, I don't remember the exact name of it, but was like, oh, yeah, she was a member for a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like it was one of those things for her that was very much in line with her very, very leftist yeah. politics. And then as things kind of shifted in the world in the 19. 19- 50s, she stopped participating and was no longer a member. But we don't have much more info than what I just said. Yeah, like, yeah. We really don't. She didn't seem to record anything about her thoughts on it or her interest in it. She doesn't seem to have been super active because it would have been more obvious, I think, to more people and the the ASIO would have had more concrete information than they did so it's a little bit, it's one of those strange things that comes up a lot where it's like, she was a communist. And it's like, yeah, yes, but was she, like, was she practicing? <laughs> it sounds like well, when you were talking about someone lapsing as a religious uh, follower, yeah. but she seems to not have been doubled down into it by any means. Right. Well, what's so one of the things that we've talked about related to, like, the United States labor movement Uh, and, like, the civil rights movement in the United States is that, like, a lot of these movements had a lot of ideas in common with the Communist Party about, like, equality and workers' rights and all of that. And my understanding of communism in Australia specifically, especially in, like, around the 1940s-ish, was like, really strong connections to the labor movement and to organized labor um, and to, like, anti-fascism if, as as fascism started to grow in parts of the world. And so I think it's a lot of people immediately start to think about, like, the Soviet Union and Soviet politics and things like that. And it's like there were some other nuances <laughs> involved. Right. And so if somebody's outlook was, like, very, very pro-trade union and pro-equal rights and pro-economic equality, it's it's not all of that, all that surprising. No, it completely tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did see in a brief mention in the New York Times uh, where they did that thing that they do obituaries for people that never got Oh, yeah. Real obituaries. Um, There was a reference to an interview that I never found mentioned anywhere else where her daughter said that even after she had retired from her last job, she lived a pretty quiet life, but she did go out and protest Mm -hmm. the Vietnam War, which also tracks. uh, But I didn't find any other information about it. So that's another thing that I didn't really feel like merited inclusion because we Mm -hmm. couldn't substantiate it in any kind of way um what an interesting woman yeah who you know did a lot for science did a lot for women's rights without realizing it um I mean I'm sure she realized it but like sure I don't think the women's rights movement really recognized her as a an important figure until much later um I still just love that she's like I'm on a ladder you ding dong do you really want me wearing skirts up there like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she seems like just so completely direct in all of this. I love that she was like, no, I don't really think I need to give you the date of my wedding. I don't think you need that information. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just love how it's just a little firecracker and also very smart. And even people that thought they didn't like her were like, man, she's a really good scientist. Yeah. There are a couple of notes of people in some of her biographies, particularly that longer one I mentioned earlier, where it is like, well, we, Track down this colleague who said he really didn't like her, but he really, really respected her. It's like, yeah, well, all right then. Yeah. I um, guess that's all you need. Uh, Ruby Payne Scott. I also kind of accidentally timed this so that it would come out right. I think it's going to end up being right before her birth date. And the date of her death is also right, mm. right up against her birth date by a little bit. So end of May should just be Ruby Payne Scott Festival in my heart. There you go. This week on the show, we talked about Hasakura Tsunenaga and a delegation from Japan to uh, 
to North America and Europe at a time when uh, sometimes it may seem to folks that the world was not as interconnected as it really was. That is something that we uh, talked about a lot in an interview that we did that, with Dennis Carr. We, wrench, we mentioned that interview at the beginning of this episode. It was uh, in conjunction with an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston that was all about this Manila galleon trade and how the Manila, the Manila galleon trade, like, influence life in the colonies, life in Europe, art, all of that kind of stuff. And so, like, we had already talked some about the world being, like, globally connected at that point in history when folks might not imagine that that was the case. Uh, But I thought it was really interesting to look at how Japan was more internationally connected than folks might imagine if what they think of in terms of Japan becoming globally connected starts with Matthew Perry in the 19th century. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it exactly, right? That is such a long period of their isolationism Mm -hmm. that it and it's kind of been told that way at various points as well it's like japan was cut off from everyone until matthew perry arrived it's like no 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 this the things that we talked about in this episode also makes it clear that this was not like a light switch that was thrown and suddenly japan's borders were shut down that it was sort of a process that took place over a period of time and uh, that the century or more leading up to the borders being totally closed, like, had a lot of conflict um, going on. Like, Japan's concerns about whether Spain would basically conquer Japan based on what we know of Spain (laughs) in this 17th century, like, those were valid. Like, they could see what had, you know, they could see that Spain had basically taken over the Philippines. They had, you know, heard from people in New Spain, like, uh, what was happening to, you know, the indigenous people that were, they were not living in, like, total, a total vacuum. Uh, So, like, concerns about what a deeper relationship with Spain would mean, like, those were really valid concerns. But also... A uh, terrifying and violent time to be a Christian living in Japan. Um, and there were people who continued to uh, be Christian and practice Christianity in Japan after that, but had to do it in like total secrecy. One thing that I said to Holly while working on this <laughs> was that I resolved that when this episode was done, the next thing I was going to work on would be something that just did not have an outline that was full of may have and possibly, and this is a little bit unclear, because these three episodes, not totally right in a row, but very close together, have all been very challenging just due to a lack of clear information and resources about Mary Dyer and Michalina Wattier and uh, and Hasakura Sunanaga. Yeah. I don't know. I sometimes love those mystery ones because you can go, here are the three options and you can kind of, to reference another recent one, Occam's razor it a little bit and be like, well... Yeah, sure. Really? What of these seems the the most likely and involves the least supposition? Yeah. Um, I do want to point out, too, that I think probably, in addition to thinking Japan was closed off forever until the Perry Expedition... I also suspect that many people, and for me, it I didn't realize this until I was well into adulthood, that Christianity was already in Japan well before I would have guessed. Yeah. Right, like the idea of Christians being persecuted in Japan before the 19th century is not something I think most people realize, at least yeah, certainly yeah, not yeah. in my age group, um, because there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> A lot of very slanted accounts that suggest that, you know, when European and American colonists started traveling beyond North America into other places, they brought Christianity with them. And it's like, oh, no, beaten to the punch on that one, guys. Yeah. I had on my short list for a really, really long time. Um the mass crucifixion that we talked about briefly in this episode where 
the San Felipe incident had happened and a, a group of Christians was like rounded up and and tortured and crucified. Like that was horrifying. Uh, and I was having sort of the same mental process when I heard about this happening, which was that I did not even know that there were any Christians in Japan at the time that that happened. Like that I had really only heard about any of that relating to like the 19th century and beyond. And uh, finding enough specific information about it and to, to make it a whole episode was really challenging. And it was one of those things where there was one specific book and one specific library. And I was like, maybe if I get that book, I can do it. And I went and got that book, which turned out to be a source that was used on this episode. Uh, and I very quickly was like, even with this book, I don't, I don't have what I need. So it had just been sort of lingering uh, and I'm glad doesn't feel like the right word because it is such a horrifying incident to talk about. Um, but like winding up finding a different topic that was related to it where, uh, there could at least be mention of it. Yeah. Uh, I appreciated. <laughs> On a lighter note, yeah, the way um, we talked about and and you found in your research that there are a lot of different takes on how the delegation, the embassy, as it were, was portrayed, made me think about networks doing upfronts. Yeah. <laughs> No, these guys are going to probably maybe be great leaders in Japan. It's kind of like the way you announce stuff that you're hoping you can get yeah. done. <laughs> you can get some ad funding for. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the term upfronts, this is an event uh, where like networks or podcast companies or et cetera are doing presentations with the hope of getting advertising commitments. Right. Like, you'll see them referenced in, like, any kind of entertainment press all the time where it's like, um, you know, NBC's upfronts, Disney's upfronts, blah, 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 where they announce their projected roster for the next year. Right. Uh, and we do them for podcasting as well. Like, every every big media thing that runs on advertising pretty much does it. But it is often, like, you are, it's it's not, the intention isn't even to be shady, but, like, sometimes you announce things that are in development mm -hmm. that may or may not come to fruition. Yeah. This gets me on a soapbox about various fandoms and how they're like, but you said Said, this is happening. Right. And it's like, well, it's planned. It yeah. doesn't always mean that plans get through to the end. Um, but yeah, it's it's a thing where it's like, here's here's what's gonna happen. Here's what we're looking forward to in our next year. And they don't always they don't always happen. But in this case, it feels like maybe it was a, a little more intentionally cloudy in the yeah. representation of what was going on. Yeah, based on the way that people writing in English wrote about this, I really thought that there was just, like, nothing to go on. And it was fairly late in my research when I found a paper written in English by a scholar writing in English who had clearly been in Japan and done a lot of research in Japan and had this long list of Japanese language sources. And I was like, whoa, I did not know any of these even existed. And so I start putting them all <laughs> into WorldCat and it's like most of them just aren't aren't in libraries here, and uh, like two or three of them. There's like, oh, I I could interlibrary loan this book in Japanese from Yale. <laughs> Great, and then tr and then try to find a Japanese speaker more proficient than my spouse, because while I can get some help with Japanese things from my spouse, like I, I full don't book translation think, is a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah. be a lot. Uh, and I was like, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to have to go with the information that is available on this in English, which is one of the challenges of doing this show. Like, we get a lot of requests from folks who are like, I wish you would talk about the history of place, more like fill in the blank. And a lot of times it's like, we also wish <laughs> we could do more on the history of that place, but, like, a lot of the information about that place is contained within that place in the languages spoken in that place, and 
is not accessible to us living in the United States, um, even if we did have translators on staff. In some cases, like, the book itself is not here. Yeah. By the way, I worry that when you say on staff, people will think we have a staff. No, we don't have a staff. (laughs) And I got asked once how many, like, recently by someone else who works in podcasting, how many people were on our staff. And I probably came off as rude, but I just started laughing maniacally. Yeah. I was like, me and Tracy. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes when I am, you know, in a cab or whatever, like I'm somewhere where I'm having a conversation with a random person and they ask, what do you do? And uh, and then they ask for more detail. And I'm like, well, Holly and I research and write every episode and we record it. Uh, our producer, Casey, does the audio editing on it. Sometimes we have uh, one of the other producers will do the audio edit if Casey's not available for some reason. But like the really the the research and the writing and all of that is Holly and me. And there will sometimes will be a pause. And then that sounds like a lot. <laughs> it's like, yes, it is a lot. Um, <laughs> and when you add in, it's a lot. And all the resources on the thing are in another country, in another language, like... It is a way higher bar to putting out a new episode from each of us every week. Yeah. Just to get the basics. Yeah. So anyway, happy Friday. Whatever's happening on your weekend, I hope it's great. We'll be back with a Saturday classic tomorrow. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. And we hope everybody has a great, great weekend. And if you're working and your weekend is a different time or you don't have real weekends, whatever's on your plate, hope it's great. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 